Okay, super. All right, well, thanks everyone who could join us. And our, this is our second meeting for the remote extension. I know there was a fair number of folks that couldn't join, so we will record and um, send it out. And along with some of the notes and uh, follow-up information that Ted's provided and some meeting information that was sent out this week about meetings with the ministry and some other uh, irrigation planning meetings. So for today's meeting, uh, Duane and I had just wanted to start off the meeting with a couple updates, uh, horticultural updates and touch base on uh, some upcoming sprays. So we thought we would do that first for five or 10 minutes and then we will turn over the meeting to our guest, uh, Ted Vandergulik, who is going to be speaking on drip irrigation. So let me just make sure we can share your slides, Dwayne, and I think we can go ahead there. Okay. <clears throat> uh, does that come up, uh, Molly? That looks good. Let's if you just would hit the uh, slide button on the lower right hand yeah. side. That's perfect. Thank you. you. Yeah. Looks anyway, um, just two slides uh, today because we'd really like to get into Ted's discussion. But um, just a couple of timely things regarding pest control. I thought it might be worth discussing. Uh, last week we talked at length about fungicides and didn't really get into insecticides. Um, but at this time of year, there's a couple of insect pests that might be worth mentioning and, and just looking at the control options that we have available and any changes that we might have um, due to pesticide cancellations. So I was going to talk a little bit about leaf rollers and aphids. Uh, leaf rollers first, and just uh, similar to last week, um, I thought it might be worth looking at the pesticide options that we've got for leaf roller control. Um, before talking about the control, I think it's important that people are aware of the different species of leaf rollers, or at least to differentiate the single generation from the two generation species. And I think over recent years with the heavy use of spinosids and um, uh, the diamide group of chemicals, Altacor and XRL, being applied for cherry fruit fly in late June through July, we've hit the second generation of oblique banded leaf rollers pretty hard. Um, maybe not as the main target, but we are controlling them. And so we don't see as much of that population as we did maybe 10 to 15 years ago. And so we've perhaps backed off on leaf roller control at petal fall, which is when the single generation species start to emerge. So the single generation overwinters eggs and they come out um, at this time of year, or maybe a little bit late, later, petal fall timing. And uh, it is worth monitoring for those to see if they may be building up because uh, we uh, don't control that uh, species or that single generation species with the summer sprays. Uh, they're in adults at that time of year. So it, it's worth monitoring for leaf rollers at this time of year to see if there's adequate pressure to warrant a spray. And we've got a number of products uh, listed here. Uh, there's four group 28 products now, of uh, which Altacor and XRL have been around for a few years, Harvanta last year, and now another new group 28 is Viego, or yeah, Viego. Uh, I think we've relied a little more heavily on Altacor uh, as a leaf roller material at petal fall spray if we needed to take action, primarily because that material doesn't have a use really later in the season for cherry fruit fly and, and SWD, whereas the other two products, Harvanta and XRL, do. So we've tried to um, save those for later on the season and, um, you know, rely on Altacor for a petal fall spray if needed. Viego could also be used. Now that's a new product. There may, again, like the fungicides we talked about last year, last week, <laughs> there could be um, some MRL issues uh, being a new product, but uh, one thing that's mentioned on the bagel label is that it does suppress aphids. So at petal fall, you may get some beneficial aphid control or, or the benefit of aphid control at that time. Uh, BioProtect uh, BT has been a good material to use around blo uh, blossom time because it's non-toxic to bees. Um, you know, you've got to be cautious with it, not to apply it if rain is in the forecast and 
not to apply it in bright sunny conditions because it'll break down under sunlight, but it is a very effective, although fairly short lived material. Ryman is another leaf roller material that could be used. We haven't used it very much for leaf roller control, um, but it is a possibility. I believe there's some MRL issues in some markets with that product, but early season may not be a risk. We should also recognize that the active ingredient of Ryman is also included with the new product out for cherry fruit fly called Cormoran. So that's got the active ingredient of a sale and the active ingredient of Ryman in it. So we're, you know, we may possibly be using that product later in the season for cherry fruit fly. But um, uh, again, uh, residues may guide our timing on that if we do use it. And then finally, the, the spinosums, delegate, success, and then trust are really good uh, leaf roller materials, but we have limited <laughs> number of times we can apply these materials and they're important for SWD and cherry fruit fly. So we prefer to save those materials for later in the season when we're targeting specifically cherry fruit fly and SWD. And we'll also get control of OBLR uh, if, you know, the timing coincides, which is usually late June, early July. So, you know, there's a number of choices there. I think the, the key point is that people should monitor at Petal, Petal Fall to see whether or not any action is needed for leaf roller at this time. And uh, you can choose whether or not to take action, um, particularly for the single generation species, and uh, will likely get control incidentally during the summer with one of the other products targeting um, cherry fruit fly or, um, or SWD. So <clears throat> several choices there. Alticore, I think, has, has been our, you know, our choice of preference in recent years, but there's other options too that people could use. Any comments on that, Pest Molly, or any questions anybody wanted to raise? I think it's a really good summary, Duane. Um, certainly, you know, if the conditions are right, um, the Bioprotect BT products, uh, Dipel, um, are really good options if we are not in a really rainy spring, which may not fit for this year. But I agree, the Alticore would be our other preferred choice at Petalfall. And then just recall that for the European market, we are looking at the cherry fruit worm as well as one of those pests um, that you're doing some trapping for. And all of these products will also generally control that um, pest as well. So last year we had some questions, you know, about what is fruit worm? Were we finding it in traps? And I'm curious if any of the growers did in fact get any positives back from any of those traps last year. Um, if you did, it would be interesting to know because we, I think our initial look at some of those traps was uh, they were not um, what we were thinking they might be. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, the other pest to touch on, I think, uh, you know, that is coming up soon as far as control or some action necessary is black cherry aphid. And I think it, it's important to maybe take another look at this pest in our control options, since we've lost um, Admire, where did my, I guess it's uh, gone off the screen, <laughs> but it, or maybe it was on the previous slide. Um, we've lost Admire as well as um, a couple other neonics. And we've relied on Admire oftentimes as the first cherry fruit fly spray of the season and also get control of black cherry aphid at that time. And so it's, um, it's kind of a default to go to admire or had been to go to admire at that time of year as the first spray and, and we can usually pick up aphids. Without having that option to use admire this year, um, we might have to think about black cherry aphid on its own as a potential pest that needs to be controlled. Uh, the time to begin looking for black cherry aphid, especially uh, is around petal fall time or, or soon after. I mean, you may find some now, but a little bit later on when the leaf development starts to occur and on clusters of leaves right at the trunk of the tree is where they often appear first and then eventually move out to the terminals of uh, new growth. And, uh, you know, it, it, they're kind of a sporadic pest. There's no real action threshold for black cherry aphid. 
but it, it is worth taking a look and to develop your sense of whether or not uh, some action could be necessary before we get too far into the season. There's a number of options for control. We, outside of Admire, we've relied a bit on Movento as well as Closer. Uh, those have probably been our mainstays for black cherry control in recent years. Uh, remember that Movento requires an adjuvant to be included with it. And that product will also control apple media bug, which is a vector of little cherry virus. And we're gonna be talking about that more next week. Uh, Savanto Prime is another product that's quite effective against black cherry aphid and uh, is a more recent uh, registration. It's been around for two or three years now. And then a new product uh, called Versus in, in uh, group 9D is another product, uh, very good at aphicide, but we don't have a lot of practical experience with it uh, or field experience with it yet. I think those are probably our four main um, products that we might use for aphid control if we needed to take action, um, you know, early to mid season. Uh, there's a couple other products. I mentioned Viego, which is labeled for leaf roller control. It does uh, supply some suppression for uh, black cherry aphid. It isn't labeled for control, but does indicate suppression. Belief, um, although the rate has been increased for belief, we still find it relatively weak against black cherry aphid and it hasn't been a product that we've really gone to. And uh, pure spray green oil, which we may be using for powdery mildew control uh, mid spring could also provide some control of black cherry aphid. So those are the, the choices primarily for aphid control. And I think the key point is uh, you've got to look a little more closely uh, this spring for aphid development because we're not just going to be taking action with the first cherry fruit fly spray using Admire. All right, comments, uh, Molly or anybody from the group, questions, discussion? Not seeing any questions come in, Dwayne, but I think that was a really good overview. And again, you know, I think Movento, Closer, and Savanto have worked really well for us in cherries the last several seasons versus, again, the question is really around MRL um, because it appeared to have fairly low um, threshold levels. So perhaps use that one with caution um, until we get a little bit more experience. But scouting seems to be the, the way to go this year and, and definitely be looking. And up to this point, we haven't seen much activity, but that likely could change um, going forward. Uh, just as we uh, had discussed um, on other things, diseases and that, I wanted to mention a number of you have um, sent photos or, or noticed that you're starting to have some active bacterial canker this week as well. So just, uh, you know, this again is probably a time with the shift in the weather temperatures and, and the rainfall that we've had that you should be looking uh, for signs of bacterial canker and possibly considering some control options that we've discussed in the last meeting. So I think that's it. Thanks, Dwayne. I don't see any other questions coming in. So I will hand it back to you, Dwayne, to introduce Ted, and we can get on with our, our main presentation. Okay, well, that's great. Well, we're really fortunate to have Ted Van der Gulik with us here this morning, to, uh, to this afternoon, I guess now, to talk about uh, irrigation management. Uh, some of you probably know Ted and others may not be familiar with him, but uh, whenever agriculture irrigation management, uh, that topic comes up, either Ted's present in the room or we're talking about him or we're using a manual that he wrote. Uh, he, he's certainly guided irrigation practices in agriculture throughout the last um, 20 or 30 years or maybe more, <laughs> Ted, I hate to say how many years, but anyway, we really have appreciated your involvement, not only from the producer's perspective, but um, to help us out with um, irrigation water district management and to develop um, you know, the agricultural water demand model that was first started in for the Okanagan Valley. And, and then Ted helped me apply that model to the water service area, area here in Ericsson uh, two years ago to develop the water demand study for this uh, district. So, you know, we've, we've got <laughs> probably Canada's renowned expert for irrigation management here with us in the room this afternoon. And we're really fortunate and I don't want to take any more of his time away, Ted. So we're, you know, we're glad to have you here. Thanks very much for participating. Welcome. 
<clears throat> so I guess I can share the screen, Molly. Yeah, it should be good to go there, Ted. Give it a try. Okay, I'll give it a try. Can you guys see that? Looks good. Just uh, okay. if you hit the slideshow, then I think we'll get the full view. There we go. Perfect. Okay, so um, I, I did a, a session for Nova Scotia, and I rebuilt this for Creston, so um, so I could try to do it in about half an hour, and then maybe a little bit of time for questions. I do have a lot of online tools, a few of them I want to show as well, so we'll get right to it. Um, talk about operating and managing a drip system, and I'm going to talk about you know, a little bit about determining your water requirement and then scheduling your drip system. And there's a lot of information that could be presented. So I'm kind of paring this down. Uh, if people want more detail, we would probably have to have a much longer session like we did in Nova Scotia. So I'm just showing this slide about the BC Agriculture Water Calculator. It was built off the Ag Water Demand Model that Dwayne talked about. I'm not going to go to it now because I don't want to flip between um, the internet and my slide presentation, but I will come back to this at the end of the presentation. Now, what this tool does is it'll calculate the amount of water that you should use annually for your farm. So it's a really good place to start when you kind of know how much water you should be using annually approximately. I mean, it changes from year to year because of climate. And if you're metered at all, then it's really useful because you can see where you're at with your metered use compared to what the calculator would be providing. This is a tool that the province now uses and farmers use when they're applying for a water license. I also want to talk a little, just a tiny, weeny little bit about when you're managing your drip system. It's good to know what the flow rate of your emitters are, because no matter what we do, and we talk about scheduling here in, the in, the, in a bit, if your emitters are not throwing out the amount of water that you think they are, you need to adjust or you need to do some treatment on your drip lines to clean them out. And emitters will clog up a little bit over time. Uh, a new emitter five years later will be reduced substantially if no maintenance has been done on it. And they can get plugged up by organic material, algae growth, silts and clays that grow in the water, precipitation and so forth. So the thing to do is, this is a picture here of show you different ways of doing it. If you had a tape system, you would have to get a, a section of tape and have it operating for 15 minutes into some kind of a funnel or so that you can collect or if it's a drip system you can just put little containers underneath the emitters and just monitor what the flow rate is. Each emitter will have a flow rate it might be a two liter per hour emitter so put a container in there run it for 15 minutes or so and see what you're collecting. If it's not two liters per hour your system is starting to clog up a little bit and therefore um, there's an indication that some maintenance needs to be required and the emitters will always start to plug up towards the end of the lateral line, because that's where all the sediments and things start to appear. So one of the best things to do is to flush your lines at least once a year. Uh, just go through maybe at the beginning of the year or at the end of the year before you shut it down, just flush you, all the lines, make sure everything's flushed out so that the emitters at the end of the line don't get clogged up um, in preparation for the following year. So this is an important thing. And if you are being plugged up with precipitates and stuff, well, we won't get into that today, but there are things that you can do. Just recognize that an older system won't put out the same amount of water as a new system. So why do we schedule, really, when you're talking about irrigation scheduling? And I think most of us kind of know it's about trying to match up the water supply or the water that you're giving to the plant with the plant's demand. And if you look at this particular graph here, you can see that an irrigation system peak flow rate is something like this. The average flow of an irrigation system might be something quite a bit lower, but we always design our irrigation systems to match the peak time of the year because that's when we want to be able to keep up with our plant. If we're doing that and we're matched up to the peak, obviously if we're earlier in the season or later in the season, we need to apply a lot less water. There is an advantage to applying more water early in the season just to get the soil moisture up to profile. And that's especially important if you're heading into dry conditions and the water supply might be limited. You can use your soil as a storage medium and put more water on in the spring just to raise the, the moisture up a bit and have water stored going into the hotter part of the season. This is some work that we did in Southeast Kelowna way back in the 1990s. We had um, a monitoring system on scheduling going. We monitored everybody's water use with meters. And we also monitor climate to determine what they should be using 
And you can see here that the pink line is kind of what farmers were using. And the blue line is what they probably should have been using throughout the irrigation season. And at the peak of the year in July and August, it's about the same, what they should be doing. But the potential water savings are is, is this area between the two lines. So we're applying more water here and more water here. And there's a water saving that could be had by just scheduling your irrigation early in the spring and later in September. Scheduling usually doesn't have to happen in the middle of summer because you're, if you design it correctly, you're running at peak, you run the system and you just run it again. Not quite true with drip irrigation because we just usually aren't running 24 hours a day like we are with a sprinkler, but the same concept kind of applies. So there are a number of irrigation scheduling methods. We can use soil moisture, and this is something we, we tried back in secret in the 1990s and people still use them today. Or we, use, we can use climatic data. Uh, like a weather station. If we look at soil moisture, there's a number of options here. There is um, tensiometers, which I like because you can just weed them, nothing electronic is required. You can get electrical moisture resistant blocks like a watermark. You need a meter to be able to read that, but you only need one meter and you can install a number of these units. Um, advantage of the watermark is you can install a lot of them for the same cost as a tensiometer and you only have to buy one meter so you can put more units in the field um, and the cost is less. And the other advantage of the watermark is that you can read to a higher moisture, uh, higher drought level. So usually the tensiometer will crash when it gets to 70 centibars or 60 centibars. It can't read anything above that. Whereas the moderate watermark can go to about 200 centibars. So if you're in a clay soil, and it's starting to dry out, it can very easily get over 70 centibars and still have enough moisture in it, but the tensiometer can't read it. And so if you're in a clay soil or something like that, you would really wanna to go to a watermark as an option. And then there is more sophisticated, this is an older version of time domain reflectronomy, reflectronomy but there are newer versions. Grow point and others have been developed, this is a grow point, but they've developed newer technologies. They are very accurate. You, uh, you have to kind of dig a hole, install them or whatever, and you can have them installed permanently, but you have a, a fairly expensive meter that has to read that. They're very accurate, used quite often for scientific purposes. And I'm not sure what the cost of these for our growers, whether we need to go that route right now. I would, in the future we might, but at this point in time, I don't think we would, I'd be sticking more to the conventional tensiometers, watermarks or other devices. So just looking at a tensiometer, um, it's got a reservoir on it that you fill up with distilled water and put the cap on it to seal it off. You can have some water stored in the cap so you don't have to carry distilled water with you. If it, this sort of gets gone down too far, it crashes, you can open up the lid and add more water in. And you're reading the tension right on the gauge. And so here's a, sh uh, a shot of the tension. Now, the lower the needle reads, the wetter your soil is. Some people, I've been to places where people said, I, I can't get this needle to move. I've been putting on tons of water, it's still reading like five. And then you go dig a hole and you got a bunch of water in the hole. I said, that's because you don't need to apply water when it's low. You want it to move up. And when it gets up to maybe 30 or 40, that's when you want to apply water. And I'll show you a chart on that in a minute. So low readings are wet, high readings are, are dry. If you have a sweat, wet soil, they may not start to move at all. If your soil is relatively dry and you install this in the ground, it'll move within minutes and you'll start to see it move up uh, very quickly. So they're very quite responsive. Cost, uh, I'm gonna say around the 125 to $150 mark for each one of these units. And now you can also get units that will connect to your controller so that the controller will turn off and on depending on the tension. So you set your time in your controller, say you're gonna water every night starting at 10 o'clock. If there's enough moisture in the soil, it won't start. It'll wait till the next day. And then of course it will start. So you can override your controller with these devices if you get comfortable with them. You always need to install with cherries too because your rooting depth is more than just a foot. It's going down quite a bit deeper. So you wanna know what the moisture level is close to the surface and you wanna know what it is deeper down. So usually you install them in pairs and then you get a reading, a moisture reading between the tips of these tensiometers sort of giving you an idea what's going on. Um, if the if the sensor quite deep has got moisture and the sensor closer to the surface shows it's drier, 
well, you maybe not irrigate quite as long as you normally would, and vice versa, you irrigate longer if the deeper one says it's dry and the one at the surface says it's quite wet, you're not getting the moisture moving down to the rest of the root zone, so irrigate longer to get the moisture to move down. The watermark is just actually this little device at the end. It's got some wire on it that you put through a tube and attach to these two terminals at the top. So you can make them any depth that you want. Uh, the leads are quite long. You install them just like a tensiometer. Uh, drill a hole in the ground, put it in there, make sure it has good contact. And then you use this meter to take readings on it. So uh, nice system as well. Uh, I, we, I don't really have a preference either way. I probably like the tensiometers because you can just walk by and read it and see what it says. So I kind of mentioned the difference between the two already. Tensiometers don't read as high a level. Uh, watermarks will read higher. Watermarks are cheaper. You can leave them in the ground over the winter time. I didn't mention that because they won't freeze up. Tensiometers you have to take out. If you leave them in over the winter, the water will freeze, they'll break, and so you'll have to replace them. Um, other than that, um, the cost, I think, is a really big difference here. So there's a chart that is in our sprinkler manual in our man irrigation management. Uh, I think anybody that, if you buy a tensiometer, they'd be able to get you the chart. There's also some fact sheets online on irrigation scheduling that probably has this chart in it as well. And so what you do is you, you have to know your soil type. So let's assume we have a sandy loam soil and we're shooting for a 50% moisture depletion. And that's normally what you do if you're running sprinklers. You say, well, I'm gonna deplete about half my water. So on a sandy loam soil for 50%, it would be about a reading of 40 on the tensiometer. So when you, read, when you hit 40 centibars, it tells you you've depleted 50% and it's time to irrigate again. However, with a drip system, we don't really do that. We don't want the drip system to run where you deplete half your water. We want to deplete about 20%. We always try to keep the soil and moisture level higher with the drip system than with the sprinkler system because then the plant is happier, grows better, everything's fine. So maybe a 20 to 30% depletion at max. Again, if you look at this with, uh, in this case, I'm using a fine sandy loam, the reading would be about 15 centibars. So when this needle comes up to 15 centibars, it says my drip system should be operating. And so you wanna monitor over a couple of days if there's rain and that, but it gives you an idea about your runtime. If you're constantly around 15 centibars and you've been irrigating for a few days, every day with your drip system, for example, you're bang on as to what the runtime should be. If the needle drops down, you say, I'm probably overwatering and cut back a bit. And conversely, if it moves up, you know you have to run, run it longer. Uh, if you're on whatever daily regime or every other day regime that you are using. So very handy, good way to go. The other way is to use climate data. And this is handy because you can get the stuff right offline. And I'm gonna show you a tool that you can use as well to give you an idea of the runtime of your drip system. So I'm not really gonna to go too much into FAPA transpiration, but that's the unit that we want to measure. It tells us how much water the plant is using. Each plant, of course, uses that water differently. So you have to apply a crop coefficient to that to apply to what that crop is actually using. So if you were growing, for example, uh, a cactus plant versus a cherry tree, you know they're gonna need different amounts of water and that's where these crop coefficients come in. The calculator I'm gonna show you has the crop coefficients built in. And you can also go online to find what the various crop coefficients are. So when we start talking about climate monitoring, there's a number of ways you can go. Research stations have weather stations. We've installed weather stations all over the province. There is one in Creston. I'm gonna go do it today on Farm West. You can use class A pans or other pans and measure the evaporation of the pan. Some people have done that in the past. And you can also buy an etmometer that comes out of uh, Colorado. And it's just the same thing, water evaporates through this and you can actually read it right on the scale as to what the evaporation has been over the last day or a week. And you can also hook these things up to your controller to tell your controller when to irrigate or not. These things are obviously a little bit more expensive uh, than just a pan and a weather station would cost you even a little bit more. And something about, um, and sorry, you also need to measure your rainfall, obviously, because we need to know what mother nature is giving to the crop. So we know how much we have to augment it and, and the weather station will do that as well. So um, um, if you're gonna use climatic irrigation scheduling, likely you're gonna use a climate station data to track the actual ET. 
And remember that um, the irrigation systems are usually designed for the PKT. So we want to establish what the PKT is and see what the runtime is on that. And I'll show you a slide here in a second. Um, and then you can determine the run times and adjust as necessary. I'll go through an example here. And by the way, on these weather stations, there's only one that is hooked up to Farm West and Creston. Probably could have another one. And if your organization in Creston uh, would want to have an additional weather station and wanted to fund it and hook it into Farm West, the person to contact is Stephanie. There may even be a program under the EFP program that you can somehow get one paid, partly paid for. We're talking about a cost of about, I think, $4,000, $4,500 like that to put in your weather station connected to Farm West. And, um, and Stephanie has details on that. And also, if you did do that and was connected to Farm West, we would look after the maintenance for a few years. And she has details on that program if you're interested in following up. So coming back to the simple schedule using a, a, calcul a calculation on ET, Let's assume our peak ET is about five millimeters per day, which is what it is in the Creston area, roughly. Uh, and you calculate it, if I wanted to replace that peak ET of five millimeters per day, and there's ways of calculating that in our drip manual, but also on this online scheduler that I'll show you in a minute. Let's say that running time was 150 minutes. Once you know that, and you monitor Farm West, and you see what the ET is, and let's say now you're saying, hey, the ET in the last, day was three millimeters, over the next week, it's gonna be around three millimeters. What should my runtime be? It's just gonna be a ratio of 150 minutes and three is three fifths, so three over five, three millimeters as opposed to five millimeters. Just put that in the calculation, simple, very simple. It's 90 minutes. So if you're using ET to monitor and adjust your irrigation, and you were knowing at peak it was 150, you'd look at the actual ET and say, I'm gonna set it for 90 minutes over the next week. If the ET goes up to four, you would increase the runtime to 120. If it drops down to two, you would drop down to 60 minutes. So you can adjust, you wouldn't probably do it every day, but you could adjust it every other day. And then the real trick with this is you really don't know if, if you're bang on in all of this. And that's where the tensiometer is really good. You put a tensiometer in some locations and just see if they're moving or not based on what you're doing. And after a while, you'd become an expert of what you need to do on your farm for your soil type because the tensiometer tells you you're putting on too much or not enough. You've calculated it with the ET. So now you know if these numbers are right and you have to adjust them a little while. Down the road, you may not even have to look at a tensiometer. You know exactly what you have to do based on what the ET level is saying. So I mentioned Farm West. I'm gonna to go to it in a minute. Farm West is a um, tool that's operated by the Pacific Fuel Corn Association and the Ministry of Agriculture. And you can go in and get the ET value and you can also see a, a, a future level. And I'll, I'll go to that in a minute. Just wanna make sure I don't have anything else to show you. And I'm also going to go to this irrigation scheduling calculator, which uses the data from Farm West. So we pull Farm West data into the calculator and it makes the calculation of your runtime. So with that, I'm going to stop this share and I'll see if I can share my um, now I got to find my, I know how to get to my uh, internet thing. Steph, how do I always do this? Do you remember? I think you just have to click share again and then select the internet browser. There you go. Um, yeah, oh, well, you, you no, that's not the internet to, browser. You have to exit the PowerPoint presentation first. That's what it was. Thank you. So I will close that down. And then I will share. Um, I think I can share the. You know, just a second here. There we go. Can you guys see that now? Okay, so I'm into Farm West. Thanks, Steph. I always forget how to do this. I feel like my right hand person here giving me directions. <laughs> so that's good. So we're into Farm West. It's just, it's on the link that I sent to Molly. When we go to farmwest.com, you can go to a station map and you can look for the stations that way. 
I'm already in the province of BC. I'm not in the lower mainland though. I'm in the Kootenays. So I'll click Kootenays and then I'll click Preston and I will pick a date from April the 20th to the 27th, press go. And I will get the data below here. I'm just going to change this date to make sure it doesn't, does it changes or whatever. Let's make it the 25th. There you go. Yeah, it did change. Okay. So from April the 20th to the 25th, our daily ET on average was 3.1. And I think when you're managing a drip system, you're going to want to take a range of dates. You'll also notice that it's giving us a forecast all the way through to next Saturday, which is averaging, well, it's averaging almost three and a half. So it's going to be pretty warm in the Creston Valley by what this is saying. So you would put three and a half into that little, into your formula if you're trying to work it out that way once you know what your peak is. If we went to, um, we can go back in time to last year, for example, let's go to the middle of J July of last year, because um, those are usually the hottest days. And we'll just see what it was back then. Uh, it was 6.2, and that's pretty high for Creston. Because I know, what is your irrigation district supply to you guys, Wayne? Four and a half gallons per minute per acre. Right. That would be an average ET of around four and a half. Right. And you're getting an, an ET of 6.2. So they're not even really supplying you with enough water if you're running a sprinkler system on some crops. But if you are running a drip system, you're fine. Because the drip system is more efficient. You don't need that peak of four and a half gallons per minute on the drip. So you just run longer. You have enough hours in the day to do that. But anyway, you can see that the ET changes quite a bit from six, you know, from what we are now three, it's a half. Right now it's half to what it would be in the middle of summer compared to last year, right? So it's very easy and quick to get the data. Um, it tells us what historical average is over that time. Uh, the climate moisture deficit, just if you wonder how I was calculating that, the ET in millimeters converts to a gallons per minute per acre US. So 6.2 millimeters of ET, if that was sustained over a week or two, would mean you would need 6.2 gallons per minute per acre US for a sprinkler system. If you had 10 acres, that would mean you need 62 gallons a minute to keep up and your system would be designed that way. You're designing to four and a half, so you're limited a little bit, uh, but um, that's how these numbers are used. So you can check these numbers on time and you can still use it for scheduling uh, based on what I'm talking about here. So the other thing I wanted to do, I, oops, wrong one, just a sec here, because this thing is in my way. The other thing I wanted to, can you guys see this screen? Change to the agriculture calculator. Okay, here's another tool that you can use um, just to determine how much water you would need for the whole year. So it's called the BC Agriculture Water Calculator. I sent that off to, um, to Molly. If you go to the map, you can, I've got my, you can actually go and type in your address here, or you can zoom in like I'm doing right now into the Creston, out of Creston here, just a sec. Well, just a minute. Give me a minute here. I got to zoom out to make sure I'm in the right spot. Over here. So I'm going to zoom into Creston. And as I zoom in, all the property boundaries show up. I can also click on the right top right here and change it over to a satellite view. So I can start to look for properties that might have cherries. I don't even know who this property is, but let's assume this property was uh, cherries. Once I click on that, I want to click on the irrigation tab. Then I want to select that property like that. Once I've done that, it tells me what the acreage of the property is on the right hand side here. In this case, it's two and a half acres. We can click on a bigger property if we want. No, that is not big either. It could really matter. 6.7 acres. Let's use this one. Um, you want to pick cherries, which we'll do here. The soil is already given to us but we're gonna irrigate with a drip system. Click on drip, and then you go down, it'll tell you 5.5 um, millimeters per day is the peak ET on average for the area. So it's picking up climatic data that we've got over 30 years. 
tells us what the peak flow rate is for that property based on that 5.5 in the area. But this is the number, 10,700 cubic meters per year of that irrigated area. That's kind of what you would need on average on an average year. Knowing that number, also, if you're monitoring your water use of a meter, you can see it partway through the season, whether you use used half your water or a quarter of your water or not. So it's another form of really getting a handle on scheduling and what's going on and what, you're, uh, what you can be doing there. So that calculator is very easy. You don't have to do much except click on your property. Just remember, you got to get the different views from satellite and roads. There's other layers you can go look in here. It's based on the ag water demand model. It's going to zoom out a little bit here um, that Dwayne was talking about. And you can see that these pink lines are the climate grid cells that we've calculated all the data in. And that's what the calculator is using. So any property within this, this, this pink line here will use the same climate data. But as soon as we move over here, well, here's a good example. You got this property here. It's intersecting the four grid lines of different climate states. So if you click on the property up here and you click on the property down here, you might get a different number because you're using different climate data. It will be slightly different, very, sometimes not even much different, but if you're getting a different number, it could be because you jumped the grid line to another part of your property. So that's something sometimes worth looking at. So with that, I'm going to go to the Irrigation Industry Association website. And I'm only showing you this because to get to the calculator I'm now going to show you, you go to this website. At the very bottom, you'll see calculators. And there's a couple of calculators here. And we're going to be going to the agriculture calculator. If I click on this, I think that will work. So I'm into the calculator now. I've already got my user ID and password set up. Everybody needs a user ID and password. So the first time in, it's gonna ask you to set up a profile and you're, it's all free, but we need to know who you are because if you have a problem and you email us, then we can get into the thing and we can fix things up, right? So you need a, you need a password and also to save your scenarios. You don't wanna rebuild your scenarios every, every time you go in. So you just wanna do that once by having a, an account, you can build it and you can keep it. So I'm gonna log in. This is just a disclaimer saying you can't sue us if something goes wrong. So when I'm in the calculator, I've already built all of these scenarios. And so I can go to any one of them. That's the beauty about having an account. I've made one for Creston and Cherries. I'll click on that. And then you can have a number of different systems or options under that. I've just called one called Drip on Cherries. And so then once you've done that, I'll complete the worksheets. So I'll go to the worksheets here. Now, this is a tip. When you go in for the first time and you develop your account, you're gonna to have to develop a scenario for what you wanna run. And it's important that you go in there. When you go in there, you're gonna to have to pick the type of system right up front. Because if you pick, leave it at say center pivot, and you go through this, you're gonna get the center pivot profile. And that's not what you want. You want the drip profile. So at that point, you're gonna to have to say, I want drip irrigation, I want this climate station. And it all loads up the right thing for you on that scenario that you're doing. So um, if we have time, I can go back and show you. Um, actually, I might, I might as well do that now. Just a second, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna create a new field and I'll just call it something because I, people get mixed up on this all the time. And we wanna be in BC and we wanna be in the Kootenays and we want Creston as our weather station. And then I create that. And it comes up at the bottom here. Okay. Um, and then I want to do a new system. And now this comes up. And this is the important part. I'll just make up a name on this too. But see here, it says irrigation type. When I'm doing a new system, the calculator needs to know what type of an irrigation system are you using? And if I leave it at this, nothing's, it's going to load up a center pivot system for whatever you're doing. And that's not what you want. So you got to click on here and say, what is the type of system that I have? And I'm gonna say ours is drip trickle point source. Um, and then you can put in the size of the field. That's not too important. But once you do all of that, you can then create it. And that scenario will show up and now you're into the calculations. I'm just gonna now, so that's just a very important step in making sure you put everything up right up front. Then the rest of this becomes really, really easy. So I'm gonna go back to my browser I'm going to go back to 
crust and cherries and the drip on cherries that I created before. And so now when you're in, and I'm just doing my scenario, your scenario might be totally different. I pick the plant spacing. We can actually change it. What's a good plant spacing for your cherries? Seven by 15. Well, that was close. So I'll make it seven by 15. You put in the area, that's important. And then it automatically calculates your rooting depth, your availability, code, all the parameters that you would go into our drip manual automatically get loaded. You don't have to do anything else. Just pick cherries, you're done. You can change them if you want, but my suggestion is that you don't. So we got the parameters of the crop. The next thing we're gonna do is pick out something about the soil. We can change this. What's a typical soil type? Silty loam. So let's change that. We'll remove this layer. Uh, why don't I just edit? Oh, here we go. Silty loam. Silty clay loam or silty? No, silt, silt loam. Silty loam. Okay. Now what's important here is that I put in enough of the soil value or I have to add another layer because um, if I don't put enough soil, the calculator is going to say you don't have enough soil for the rooting depth of your crop. So now this particular layer here, sandy loam, I can probably delete. So I'm left with my 36 inches of silty loam, which is what, um, let's just assume that's correct. The modifier is only if you don't think there's enough leaching in your soil, you can add a modifier. Um, and we can do that here for um, rooting depth greater than two feet, we'll do that. So it adds a modifier in there of 10%, just making sure that we apply enough water to leach out any salts in that from the root zone. You don't have to do that, but it's giving us the soil storage capacity and the maximum soil water deficit, which the calculator needs. So all of those things are pretty easy. They're just generally loaded for you. And the next step is, is important is the irrigation design. So seven feet, you're probably gonna have at least two meters per plant. I put in an emitter flow rate of four liters per hour each. It's a gallon per hour emitter. You can put in anything you want there. I put down that we're irrigating every day. You can also go every other day if you want. It automatically calculates your application efficiency, emission uniformity, all of that. And you can change those if you want by overriding it. And it tells us we're applying eight liters per hour per plant, which is I'm not quite sure what is 0.02. Something is rounded off in here. So probably because it was from gallons of liters rounded off, but that's, that's pretty close. So the next thing we wanna do is just schedule our irrigation. So we go to our scheduling tab and it's already selected for us Creston because we told it that's where it was. And so now what we need to do is pick our start date. And I'm going to pick, um, I'm gonna just go back to when it was hot the last few days. April 14th is our start date. And I picked April the 19th as our end date. So we got about five days in there. I tell it to load and update the graphs. And up comes the graph and this graph. Now, I noticed this today. We have a little bit of a problem with this graph here because we don't have large enough units in here. So it's topping out up here because we're putting on uh, eight liters per plant and it's not showing that. So we have to um, get that fixed, which we'll do. The important thing is it's telling us our run times. If you were going to be irrigating in April, the suggest and of course, it doesn't know how wet the soil moisture already is. It doesn't know, the calculator doesn't know. If you've got a lot of moisture in your soil already, you might not want to go at this route. So really, it always works in real time. So as you move forward, you think it's getting kind of dry, you use the calculator, it brings in farm west, it brings in all your data, everything's calculated, and it gives you a run time. So if it was me, pretty close to three hours, except for this one anomaly, I would run it for three hours. In, 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 in April, that's what I would have been doing for a while. And then you think, then you check your tensiometer and it says, oh, it's getting wetter. I'm going to shut it down for a while. It works in real time. So you go back to the calculator. Once you develop your profile, you can exit it. Next time you come in, that thing is already there. You go right to your scheduling tab, click on, click on it, and it gives you the runtime right away. You don't have to enter anything. So it's very easy moving along once you've developed your scenario in there. That's how it works. It's as easy as that. You can, um, there's more, a few little features in here. Oh yeah, one we can also then do is say, I'll save it and then I can view and print reports. So if you wanna keep a track of this, you get a nice report back, which is a PDF that you can save uh, either on your computer or whatever. And it summarizes all of that. 
It tells you how much water you're applying to the plant, to the plant water requirement, what the run times are, uh, what coefficients were applied. If you want to change that, you can. It tells you what your system was set up at, so you have a history of what you've done here. So that's handy. Print it off, use it as a reference. If you did this all the time, you would get very proficient at it and you would know exactly what to do. Instead of guessing at your runtime, it's based a little bit on science. I can tell you that, uh, and one of the reasons why you want you to set up an account other than you can save your scenarios is that if something goes wrong with the calculator, we can email everybody saying something is wrong with it. And that, um, that can happen, right? So now i got to get back to that. So when I was in here earlier today, I was picking a different date. I'm going to try it again now. I think I picked something like the 23rd to the 26th or something. And then I told it to run and I got a prompt coming up. And it's not doing it now, but I got a prompt. Well, it doesn't give me a run time. And the prompt, oh, there it is, the prompt. It says this climate station has issues on these days. So I've picked a, a range on where the climate station wasn't functioning properly. No fault of the calculator, but it gives you this prompt. The data is incomplete. You can't use it for those days because obviously if we're missing climate from a day, the calculator is going to calculate an erroneous value, which we don't want. So we rather just give you the prompt saying, okay, the calculator wasn't working for these two days and it may have been recent. So we got to find out what's going on with that calculator. And that's maybe something Stephanie can check on because it's very recent in the last couple of days as to what's going on with that Creston climate station. We have over a hundred stations. We do maintain them, but some stations are owned by others. And if they don't maintain them and the data is not working properly, then of course our calculator won't work. So, so that's, basically, uh, that's basically what I was going to go through today. Um, this is the most useful tool because it combines the farm west along with the drip manual that you don't have to read if you're using this tool if you read the drip manual it's following all the same it's built on the same premise um yeah any questions or comments and how widely uh, is this calculator being used do you think uh, by tree fruit growers in the okanagan or I mean, well, that's a really good question, Dwayne. We have Google stats we could go to. It is being used. I could tell you at one point in time, a, a few years ago, <clears throat> Environment Canada, the forecast that we're using in the rainfall comes from Environment Canada. And Environment Canada changed their, uh, their rainfall from rather than a millimeter of rainfall, they changed it to a percent of rainfall. So they said the rainfall is going to rain 80% today. And the calculator took in 80 millimeters of rain as the number because of that. They didn't tell us. So of course the calculator is not working. It's showing over two inches of rain and all it's saying is maybe a bit of stiff rain that day. People in the Okanagan were using the calculator and they emailed us and say, this calculator isn't working. I've been using it for years and now it's not working. What's going on? We caught on and we had to get a different rainfall feed to make the calculator work. But that told me that people were using it because they would never have bothered emailing us if they were never using it. And there were a number of people that were using it. And we could certainly get the Google stats to see how much of it's being used all over the place. And it could be used in Nova Scotia and other places too, because we have climate stations that go clear across the country. And what's ironic in some of these places like Ontario and Nova Scotia, there's more people using it than in BC. And we built it here in BC for BC farmers. So it's not going to be perfect by any means. You can see when I was giving you the before we had, you know, four minutes, four hours, 20 minutes, like, you got to take a little bit of that with a grain of salt, round it off, get it to the nearest hour or nearest 15 minutes, and then monitor, still monitor. Don't go basically, basically straight on the calculator until you really are comfortable with it. I would never suggest just going by it, but it is, um, it is really good in the sense that some people on some crops overwater tremendously and the calculator brings them back in. And then on the other side, some people don't water enough and the calculator says you need to water more, right? You know, we did a project here with the regional district starting in 2008 on a pilot project looking at water use within some of the farms in the Erickson Water Service area. And we found exactly the same thing. Uh, meters were installed on some farms and we analyzed the data and there's quite a range in use. And I think just an understanding of, of how 
much water is being used and how to calculate how much water might be used or could be used provides a lot of good information to the grower um, to help guide their use in the future. And we, you know, we, <laughs> without that in, without that data, you know, everybody's got their own method, which in their mind is right. And there's quite a variability in, in the way people irrigate, the, the length of time, the duration, um, startup time, maximum water use throughout the season and so on. And I think uh, just to have a, a reasonable discussion and understanding, uh, these calculators really have some value. And I, I'd really like to encourage people to use them. And this district is undergoing a, a project possibly for universal uh, metering here. And, uh, you know, if that does go ahead, um, certainly that uh, metered information would provide more useful information for the farmers to help evaluate what they're doing and plan what they're going to do in the future. Yeah. But I know it's just like it's quite often uh, people that run districts, they're not farmers, not always the case, but if they're not farmers, they're going by a lot of things and making decisions that don't really often make sense by growers, right? And, and I'm not in favor of, of uh, allocating water exactly by a crop on an irrigation district because your crops may change. So I think everybody should get the same allocation of water uh, and all of that. But then a guy with a drip system has the advantage of if you're metered to run, to use less because you're more efficient. And if the district says, we will give you a break on your water bill because you've used less than that set amount, that's great. But setting that amount to a lower amount, I'm not in favor of because what if the guy changes crops and now you have a system that the district has not allocated you enough water. And so it's rather, I'd rather have everybody allocated the same. And then if you want to pay based on use, that's fine. Secures water for agriculture. We're not always on the same crops. We don't know what holds in the future. And the other, I think we've talked about this, Duane, the other big consideration is climate change. And if you allocate to what you have need today, where is the climate change factor in all of that? And I think we can accom accommodate a climate change if we're allocating water according to this calculator, the calculations that we do today, because we could become more efficient to fit in with that. But if you're allocating to what you actually really, really need here on a drip system, for example, you're already efficient. There's no there's no improvement on efficiency. And so you're going to be short of water under climate change. So these are all the kind of considerations that need to come into play. And from the province too, when the province is issuing a license, we're going through this argument right now. Farmers want to, they want to allocate their license based on climate change, some of them. And I'm not, because of the calculator they're using, we don't have that in there. And I'm kind of against it because I'm saying, why would we give you more water today that you don't need today, but you might need in the future? But by doing that, we're, we're allocating all the water. So other farmers coming in the system, there's no water for them. And you've got water tied up in your license that you're not using today. And then 20 years from now, when climate change comes along and the stream's got lower flows, you can't even take that water anyway. We're not going to be able to give you your climate change amount because the stream flows have gone down because of climate change. So none of this makes any sense about over allocating today. So within reason, we allocate kind of what you need. But we got to look at the situations where we have new efficient systems. We might want to bump it up a little bit. So that's a whole other topic. Kind of does get into the scheduling and all that because you have to schedule well to fit into that volume. And you have to schedule well too because you know it later in the summer, your stream might dry out. So you have other considerations that happen there too, right? You're on an irrigation district. That's great. They do the storage. They supply it. But we still want policies that really support the farming community and doesn't limit our ability to make money in the future. Thanks for those comments, Ted. We had a couple questions about the practicality of scheduling. Um, growers wondering, you know, how often should they be looking at doing the calculations and updating their schedule throughout the season? That's a really good question. And I think what you'd want to do is like, you want to look at sort of what's been happening. Has it been around the same temperature, cloudy, whatever, for a week or two, you could stay on the same schedule. But then if it turns around and becomes sunny and hotter, you're going to want to look at and say, how do I make a change? And then if you know, if you go into the season a little bit further, you say, okay, my crop is growing, it's leafed out. I'm trying to grow a lot of cherries. It's, it's more critical. They get, I'm going to check it again and make sure that we're doing the right thing. And, and you never want to go right on just the calculator that I'm showing here without monitoring your soil moisture too. That's the critical, because that's the proof of the pudding of what's happening, right? And then after your cherries have been harvested, you know, later in August or September, you can obviously cut back. And so then 
not really an expert on cherry oil, cherries, how they work, but if the crop is off, they obviously need less, but they're going to need some water forming buds going into the fall. And so you got to make sure you have enough water going in there, but it would be less than the peak time of year. So a real, real, real good rule of thumb would probably, I would be checking it at least monthly and maybe a little bit more often if the climate has really changed, the weather's changed. And that's gonna change from one location to another. I mean, the tensiometer is nice because you can just walk by it and take an immediate little look and see what it says. It gives you a reading right away. So oh, it's still the same, I'm doing fine, right? And generally, where can growers find tensiometers? Where can they purchase these sorts of tools? Most irrigation companies will handle them. So if you contacted an irrigation company like Nal I don't know of an irrigation company in Crescent, but Nalton's in, um, in Oliver should handle them. And if they don't, they can get them in. So if they have a request for them, I'm sure they'll order them. The bigger amount you order, the, the lower the cost, of course. Um, I know the Southeast Kelowna Irrigation District at one time ordered a couple thousand of them back in the 90s <laughs> and they didn't use them all. And so I don't know if they have a whole bunch in storage that they'd like to sell at a reduced cost. There's some little tip you might want to check with them. They might say, no, we used them all, they're all gone. But they had a whole bunch at that time that they weren't using. Of course, they're going to also be 20 years old. I'm not sure that technology has changed that much. And you could probably even go online and order them through Amazon. I wouldn't doubt that you could even do that, right? might get them cheaper that way and have them shipped to you in a day or two. So you're gonna need at least two. And if you have different soil types on your farm, like the Sandy Ridge over here and there's a you know, silty loam over there, they're gonna need different water amounts and then you're gonna to have to set it up on both, right? Whether you need two on each site, um, you might wanna go somewhere in halfway down your rooting zone if that's good enough for you. We always put in two and we're doing this testing because we found that um, it was easier to know what's going on. Plus really, if you had another, the reason why you have two, if one crashes, you don't really know if it's crashed or not, but you can tell if the other one's reading and the one's reading zero, that it's, it's lost its uh, tension and you have to reprime it. So there was good to have more than one around, but um, yeah, there's some experience required with them, no question. So I have a question for Ted. Yeah. Um, so whether you're using a watermark sensor or a tensiometer, where in your drip zone do you place those? Good question. And I and you don't put it right next to the tensiometer. I would put it about, uh, I would put it sort of halfway in between the two drippers, if you have two drippers on the tree, or you put it maybe two thirds way out to, on the drip line of the tree. And so the question is a really good question because really what, what you're saying is how far is the water moving in my soil when from the emitter, how far out does it go? And if I put the tensiometer too far out, it might be reading dry, but I actually got quite a bit of water in my root zone there. So um, that's why I'm suggesting you, you always wanna irrigate over 50% of your root zone anywhere anyway. So putting it between the two emitters uh, and then out towards the drip line of the tree is the best location. Because if the emitters are on either side of your tree trunk, halfway in between would be right at the tree trunk, but you don't want to put them there. So you got to put them out from the tree trunk, maybe half to two thirds of the drip line. And if it's reading too dry, then you move it in a little bit, but that would be the ideal location. Yeah, so I can see a situation, like I've got, I've got uh, two feet between my emitters. I've actually got two lines down each row, but if I put it a foot, you know, between the two emitters at one foot and down to, you know, down two feet or would go down 18 inches for the deep one and down a foot for the shallow one, I, I could get, seems to me that quite often I could get really almost no reading on that shallow one, you know, or very little moisture there compared to. Possibly. And then the, that's why the deep one's important, right? Yeah. And so, and you can also pull them out and think, I'm not, I don't have another right location. Let me try another location and you install it. You know, so it takes a little bit of work. It doesn't take much work to install, but it takes a little feeling around. So I'm going to try putting it in over here. They will read in a few minutes. They'll start to read uh, if it's moisture, they'll, if it's dry, they'll start to they'll start. If it's really wet, they might not read, but if it's relatively dry, they'll start to read very quickly. So you get a bit of an idea about where a good place to put them is, but it has to be within the zone of influence of the emitter. So the emitter is only, stretching water out one foot, there's no point in putting it out two feet because you're not going to get any moisture, right? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Good question. Oh, 
Ted, are the uh, sensors a good guide as to when to initiate irrigation in the beginning of the season? You know, horticulturally, we quite often don't want to dump cold water on a cold soil uh, in a wet spring, and we delay irrigation, you know, two or three weeks or more, even past blossom time. This has been a fairly dry spring so far, and soils may be dry. How do we guide when to start? If you go back to this, um, just a second. It's gonna, can you guys see that screen with this calculator? Or I have to share it. Oh, can you see the agricultural yeah. water calculator? Okay. When you go on here, um, oh. it's giving you a suggested start date, May 19th. So the ag water demand model has done a calculation for cherries and the crop coefficient for cherries and all of that. And it says you got a May 19th start date to an October 2nd. That's what it's coming up with. I'm not suggesting at all that that number is right, but that's how we're calculating the, the demand in this case. Was this for cherries? No, sorry, that was for forage. Let's move it to cherries. And we'll move it to drip. I'm not sure the drip will change it, but let's see what it says now. Yeah, it still says May 19th is the start of the growing season. See, I can change that if I wanted to start earlier. So, but the calculator defaults to May 19th. And in some places it'll be earlier. So I don't know, when do you guys usually start your irrigation? Dwayne, you know? I think typically the majority of people would start petal fall or later. And there's been wet springs where we haven't initiated irrigation until mid June, but petal fall would be early May. So it, it has varied quite a bit. Right. <clears throat> this is just based on 10 years of data from 2000, 2010. So when it said May the 19th, uh, it may or may not be a good number to use. And I think the, the, the tensiometer or the calculators and all that really don't tell you when to start. What the ag water demand model does is it looks at soil moisture from January on, and it sort of determines when the soil is dry and when to start irrigating again based on your normal winters. That's how the May 19th came up. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's the same for every year. So I, I wouldn't rely on the calculator for that, but what I would do is rely on the calculator about how much water I should apply. And remember I said, it's a good idea to bring your soil moisture up so that the tensiometers are reading about say 15 centibars and then go on from there. Cause now you know you have the right soil moisture and let's just see where that goes from there. And there's probably not a harm in waiting a little bit when the trees aren't leafed out yet or anything cause they're not taking up a lot of water. So delaying is a little bit nice. The nice thing about the drip system is that you can apply it to your entire field in a day. Whereas if you have a sprinkler system and it takes you say 10 days to get across, the, the last part of your field isn't getting it for another 10 days. The drip system is getting it right away. So when you make the decision to start, you can maybe wait a few extra days to start because you know everything's gonna get water. And then you run your irrigation and say, oh, the moisture hasn't come up, I'm just gonna run it again. But once you've got it up, then you might just wanna not irrigate for a little while because the moisture is there and you don't want to put on more water, right? So I'm not a horticulturist, so I'm not really professing what the best route there is. It's a very good question. I would say if some farmer had phoned me, I'd say, go talk to Dwayne. He lives in your area. <laughs> he knows what to do. <laughs> well, so. I, I know in, in the Okanagan, some growers do or have irrigated pre-bloom. I think here typically we haven't, and maybe it's an exception that we do. But it's been a fairly dry spring, and I think I would advise growers to dig down, take a shovel if you don't have uh, tensiometers already installed, take a look and see what the soil moisture is down deeper. And, and you know, it, it gives you a good indication. And if it's moist down deeper, you may be able to delay, and uh, you, at least you've had a look and you're, you're not shooting exactly. completely fine. This is a little bit of an art when you start talking about all this stuff. I'm just giving a bunch of tools that you can look around and, and growers know a lot. Like they're way better at this stuff than me for your farm. You kind of know what's going on if you've been farming for a while. So usually they make good decisions and then just these tools are just there to help them a little bit, right? You sort of say, well, I'm gonna run, but how long should I run for? Well, the calculator says three hours. Well, I'll just go with the three hours and check things out and see if I need to give it another three hours. That's the nice thing about the drip system. You can do it one day and say, that wasn't enough. I got to do it one more time. And then you can say, oh, I'm up there now. I'll wait a while. Like it's very, it's very uh, flexible because you can do it almost, you can do it daily. On daily, you can make an adjustment, which you can't with most other types of systems. So you have an advantage that way, right? Yeah. Good questions, you guys. 
I can't answer all of them very well, though. <laughs> Anything else? I think just maybe one more, Ted. Um, does the does the ground cover make any difference at all in these models? Most of us have a have a herbicide strip that's fairly clear of any kind of ground cover, and then there are some situations in orchards where there is a grass cover or other type of cover. I think in our calculator, if I go back here. Um, If I go right to the very beginning here, um, some, somewhere in here, we did have an option of a ground cover in here, but I don't see it in here now. And it may have been on some other part of the calculator, but um, calc a ground cover will make a difference because um, it can, it depends what kind of ground cover. If it's some kind of a plant taking up moisture, well, it's going to take moisture away from your tree. If it's some ground cover that's just covering the ground, like a mulch or something, it'll keep water in the soil. And that's another good reason to have some kind of a soil moisture device. You can say, is that water being taken out of the soil? It's, it's not kind of being kept there and there's no ground cover taking it out or if it's not evaporating out of the soil, I have more available. But you're absolutely right, ground cover will make a difference. And I just don't remember now where this ground cover option was, whether it was in here or not, or not. I can't, I can't remember. But your, the, the answer to your question is yes, it does make a difference. It makes a difference. You think about it like um, you see all these vegetables grown in rows in a field and they have this black plastic over top of it, right? Gives the heat to the soil, the vegetables go quicker, but it also reduces the amount of evaporation from that soil surface. So it's effectively giving more water to your plant. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think that answers all the questions that have come in, Ted. Thanks very much for the great presentation. Oh, you're welcome. You guys take care and grow some good crops out there. <laughs> great, well, it was great to have you and um, we'll, we'll wrap up, I think, at this point, but um, much definitely appreciate you showing us all those tools. I'll d sell, send out the links to everyone with the recording and hopefully we can encourage people to use the tools and also do the monitoring. Well, and if you're using a tool and you're running across a problem where nothing, something doesn't seem to be working, you can email in on the tool and then somebody will look at it. Quite often it's a mistake on the user end, but not always. There's quite often something is broken on our end or we didn't notice something or something else has happened. And of course, we're not in control of the weather station. So that could be always a problem too, right? So. For sure. All right. Thanks. Thanks, you guys. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks, Ted. Yeah. <clears throat>